Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Angelic Conflict class. This class is brought to you by the Ever Grace Fellowship Church, and we are studying the Angelic Conflict. This has been an extended study. We are now looking at a very interesting segment of the study, and that has to do with the strategies of Satan. It came to my attention that I went really fast and I did not cover the details of these strategies. And so I'm going back today and possibly for the next couple of weeks to cover these strategies in a little closer detail so that you would be able to recognize them when you see them and to avoid them. At the present time then, we need to uh, look at our <clears throat> selves as uh, people of God, and in so doing, uh, and in so doing, taking the time to confess our sins uh, wherever it is necessary for you and me to do that. <clears throat> Okay, so having said that, let's take a few moments then for silent prayer. And in uh, this silent prayer, I would ask you to name and cite the sins that you may have committed. And uh, if uh, your sins have already been confessed, then I ask you to pray for me as your communicator this evening. As you are probably already aware that um, we are... <clears throat> In the last few days before our presidential election, and as so doing, uh, then we are going to uh, elect a president. Tonight is the second and last presidential debate, and so I would assume that there are many who have opted to look at that or to uh, listen to that debate and to make uh, their uh, decision as to who to vote for on the basis of listening to that. Well, my job is to present to you the scriptures, and so whether there is a debate or not a debate, then I uh, say, damn the port torpedoes, full speed ahead, let's go forward. And so, let's take a few moments then for silent prayer, confess any and all sins which you may or may not have, and uh, if uh, you don't have any sins to confess, uh, or if uh, one just kind of crept up on you just now, then confess that sin. Pray also for me that I would be able to communicate with you this particular segment of this study. So let's take a few moments then for silent prayer, and I will close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because you've allotted to us this time to be able to study your word. We recognize, Father, that we uh, center around or center our attention around your word. And despite the fact that we are in different locations, that we can look at a computer screen and still follow along. We thank you that you have given to us this freedom and you have given to us this technology to be able to do that. We understand, Father, that this is not a substitute for face-to-face -face and that we look forward to face-to-face -face teaching. We thank you again in Christ's name. Amen. When we study the concept of the angelic conflict, we always go over a couple of verses that are found in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And this is what those verses say. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. You will notice that this 
passage ends with the words, you shall bruise him on the heel. This is because this passage is addressed to the serpent. That is the way that the passage begins. And the Lord God said to the serpent. So this is a prophetic word to the serpent detailing the fact that the angelic conflict for the serpent is going to end in utter defeat. Having said that, let's go on to our next point. And this is a little bit of our outline to catch us up as far as where we are going and what our progress is going to be like. This is capital letter F in our outline, victory on the angelic conflict. Point number two under F, tactical victory, which is accomplished by the church. It's accomplished by the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, but that's a different story. Actually, that is the material for the Tuesday night classes. Under this tactical victory, we want to find a working definition of what a tactical victory is, and we have done that. Next, we want to have a briefing as to what our role is going to be during this tactical uh, period of time. Two passages of scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, which tells us about the fact that our enemy is not human, not flesh and blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, which tells us that we are actually on angelic display and that angels are actually watching us just as we would on any given Friday going to a high school football game, sitting in the stands and looking down on the field, watching the plays, listening for the ref's calls. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 9. Next, we looked at the person of Satan, and we spent a week or so looking at that. Number four, we have looked at the rulership of Satan, and we wanted to find the legal standing of the rulership of Satan. And now we are on point number five, and you can see it flagellating there on your screen, the strategy of Satan, or satanic strategies, because there's numerous uh, of them. We will then move on to the policy of Satan and the power of Satan, but for now we are looking at the strategy of Satan, and it is this particular point that I went over really fast, and I need to go over it more slowly so that you can get it down. And so I'm asking you who are either new to this particular web page that you should uh, make sure you get these points because these are very, very crucial to your understanding of what's going on around us these days, particularly the, in the political arena in which we find ourselves. The strategy of Satan, letter A, religion is a part of satanic strategy. Religion is the creation of Satan's genius to counterfeit the plan of God. The key word here is that he has designed his plan to counterfeit, to dissimulate, to disguise itself as the plan of God. Religion can be defined as man seeking to use his own merits, his own works, to gain the approbation of God. And Satan uses that particular inclination in the Olson nature of man to advance his plan, his strategy in the angelic conflict. We come now to letter B. Satan's counterfeits, Satan's counterfeits of the plan of God in religion include the following. I'm going to give you this long list, and I gave you this, this long list the last, uh, last week that when we were together, and I went over it really fast, and I'm now going to go through it in more detail so that we can get a better grasp and appreciation of it. Satan's counterfeits of the plan of God. In other words, 
all of his disguises, all of his proxies, all of his puppet-type puppet uh, things that he uses to fool you and me in the world of religion include the following. There they are. I've got nine of them listed, a counterfeit gospel, counterfeit ministers, counterfeit doctrine or doctrines, counterfeit communion table, counterfeit spirituality, counterfeit righteousness, counterfeit modus vivendi, which would be self-righteousness, counterfeit power and dynamics, which includes miracles, healing, tongues, those types of things, and a counterfeit system of gods. All of these deal with the counterfeit plan of God. Today, we're going to center our attention on the counterfeit gospel. We're not going to quite make it to the counterfeit ministers, but the counterfeit gospel. And I want to impress upon you that there is a counterfeit gospel, a phony gospel. It looks like, it smells like, it could sound like a real gospel. I hear people on TV today who start to give the gospel and you say, oh my goodness, this is just like old time religion. And then the old boy, despite the fact that he comes from a good lineage, but he comes from a father who was a very popular evangelist in the United States, and he mucks up the gospel. And then he adds, you must receive him into your life, invite him into your heart, like he wants to come into this filthy heart of yours. What he wants to do is he wants to take that filthy heart, get rid of it, and put in a new one. He doesn't want to come in and renovate it. Counterfeit doctrines. These are doctrines of demons. These are doctrines which sometimes people follow, and they follow them religiously. Uh, uh, sometimes we call them superstitions. Don't walk under a ladder. Look out for the black cat. Halloween is coming. Huh. Can you believe that this country is now worshiping at the altar of ghouls and make-believe monsters? Then we come to a counterfeit communion table. Let me uh, throw a little bit of light on this. You know that you are in a satanic church. I know that I'm probably going to get a lot of emails that are criticizing me on this, but listen to me carefully. You know that you're in a satanic church when you walk into that church. And you find that the central piece of furniture in that church is not a pulpit. It's an altar. It's a table of communion. And the pulpit, it's relegated to a corner of the church, somewhere off to the side. And I know that traditional churches, old churches, have two pulpits. One for the Old Testament, one for the New Testament. And when the pre... When the reading is done, it is done from one of the pulpits. And when the preaching is done, it's you're getting, what, a five, ten minute sermonette? And it's not really even from a pulpit. And then maybe this individual who is uh, posturing as the, uh, the person who is representing God will say a few words to you in the language that you do not understand. Latin or some modern gibberish. So we have a whole list here. I will go through this list in more detail as um, we move on. For tonight, we are going to cover a counterfeit gospel. Counterfeit gospel. On the screen, you have a picture. It is a picture of what has been termed in our official government records as hell money. 
This is a photograph which is taken by the U.S. Customs and Border uh, Protection uh, Unit. It is a unit which uh, takes care of what currencies come into our nation. And here I want you to notice that this is called hell money. And now I want you to know as it used to be said on the radio, the rest of the story. On the 12th of February at Detroit Metro Airport, a Vietnamese couple heading through customs after disembarking from a flight from Seoul, South Korea, was stopped after they gave conflicting information about how much over $10,000 they were carrying into the United States. For all passengers arriving in the United States, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection requires that all money in excess of $10,000 be declared on an official customs form. This is simply a reporting requirement. No taxes are collected or paid on this money, which is contrary to popular belief. People say, well, that's Big Brother wants to do. This is only a reporting requirement, not a taxing requirement. Upon a search of their luggage, 93 bundles of counterfeit U.S. $100 bills and 32 bundles of counterfeit Vietnamese dong were discovered. The 93 bundles of counterfeit uh, U.S. $100 uh, dollar bills totaled $4.65 million. The amount that the 32 bundles of Vietnamese dong totaled was not reported. But we are talking about $4.6 million. The couple claimed that the counterfeit money was actually hell money, which is a type of monetary offering made to the deceased in many Asian cultures. The money is burnt in order to provide for the deceased well-being in the afterlife. What do you think? Were they telling the truth? It's like the man who went to the funeral and he promised the decedent that he would pay back the debt that he owed him and what's more that he would make a very generous contribution uh, paid to him for his long suffering. So at the wake, when the uh, coffin was open, he said, you know, I made you this promise, and so here is my money. And he wrote him a check to put it in the coffin. What do you think? Did he pay? Counterfeit gospel. Counterfeit gospel. This is where we find ourselves. And would you open your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. And I'm turning to it myself right now, and so let's uh, get over to it. And this is what it says. For Christ did not send me to baptize, comma, but to preach the gospel. And I've got it on the white block at the upper center of your screen. Let me repeat. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Well, first of all, let's just look at this last phrase what does it mean the cross of christ would not be made void in other words that the cross of christ would not be emptied of its meaning and significance what does the cross of christ mean 
It means that our Lord Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all of our sins, every single one of them. There is nothing left for you and me to pay for. In other words, when Christ died on the cross, he satisfied every legal and righteous demand of God the Father. That was taken care of. So, the first part of the verse for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and the preaching of the gospel is not to be in cleverness of speech. So now we want to understand what cleverness of speech is. Cleverness of speech. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. First of all, let's get this clear. Every believer is sent by Christ to give out the gospel and not a religious ceremony, not even baptism. Now I know that this flies into the face of many Baptist churches that believe that you have to have baptismal services every Sunday. But this verse is quite plain, quite obvious. It was not the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ to send out his disciples, and in this case, the apostles, to baptize, but to preach the gospel and to do it without the cleverness of speech. So, no baptismal uh, ceremony, no religious ceremony is to be preached when it comes to giving somebody the message of eternal life. Number two, the Greek word for cleverness is the word Sophia. I've got it up there on the screen, and I've got it, the transliteration, S-O-P-H-I-A, and then we have the Greek characters between the brackets. Now this word Sophia has the literal meaning of wisdom. That's the literal meaning, but it means much more than that. You see, wisdom in the ancient world meant that you had gone to school. Not only did you learn your three R's, but you also learned how to be able to debate in public. You would be able to form your arguments. So this means that God does not expect you or require you to present the gospel as a pretentious philosopher or professional rhetorician. Now, back a few years back, William F. Buckley was probably the most well-known speaker for traditional and conservative Americanism. He had a wonderful and beautiful vocabulary. He had an accent, despite the fact that he came from New York, had an accent which was just delightful. And you could just sit and listen to him for hours. And as he would sit, maybe in a chair, reclining in a posed, relaxed posture, he would begin to disclaim, as it were, and you would say, what a wonderful thing he's saying. And maybe you might even shake your head and you say, what exactly did he say? And when you review it, you say, boy, he said it. And it was so beautifully said. William F. Buckley. Well, God does not require you to. He does not expect you to present the gospel as a pretentious philosopher, that in, other, in other words, somebody who thinks he's big stuff, or maybe a professional rhetorician, somebody who's used to speaking. You are not putting on a show of graceful eloquence. When you are witnessing to somebody, that's not your job. Your job is not to adorn the gospel with a bunch of florid uh, phrases and words. Your job is not to construct arguments 
which are designed to humiliate the person who's listening to you. In other words, say, how dumb could you be to believe what you believe? And in so doing, you show how smart you are. And you know, there are believers in Christ, and God bless them because they need it. But they want to present the gospel and show these people that they're way smarter than they are. And they think that in so doing, that they're glorifying God. That God did not send you to baptize. He did not send you to preach the gospel in cleverness of speech. What you're supposed to do is just proclaim the facts. Just the facts. Now it may be or not be uh, that you would include the impact that these facts have had on your life. So when you give the facts, you may include, well, you know, these facts did this for me. But they don't need to. And this is what this verse is saying. Now, I want to bring this up to you because a false gospel a gospel which has been disguised or a gospel which is a counterfeit gospel will seek to snow you with highfalutin words, beautiful uh, types of uh, phrases that will make your head swim. But the real gospel will give your listener eternal life. And that is the message of the gospel. The purpose for you to give the gospel in its simplicity is so that the message of the cross does not get lost in your verbosity. Am I making myself clear? Second passage of scripture, would you now turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Now I've put them up on the uh, screen, and so let me read from the screen so that you can follow along in your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, maybe this passage of scripture seems to be a little... Um, A little much it may seem that uh, it is giving a lot of information but look at what this passage says and even if our gospel is veiled so we need to look look at the context and so as we look at the context 2 Corinthians chapter 4 let me put down what we have here uh, as an introduction number one Paul calls it, quote-unquote, our gospel. And you can see I have made it into red print. And the reason is because it is a gospel that is unique in that it excludes human good. There are other gospelers or other gospelizers that are out there in the world, but they do not exclude human good works. And you can hear them on TV. You can read them in gospel tracts. You need to repent. You need to join the church. Or you need to contribute into the tithe. Or you need to be good as best as you can. The true gospel must conform to Paul's gospel. And it excludes all human good. 
And that is why it is referred to as our gospel, because this is the gospel that comes from the, shall we say, the original fountain. All right, let me begin at verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, and the apostle Paul is saying that this ministry is something that he has received, that is God's gift to him. As we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. So despite the fact that the Apostle Paul is not only an intelligent human being, but he is also one of the most scholarly and best educated of the ancient world. He was a genius and probably the most genius person in the history of mankind outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, we have received mercy. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And in verse 2, there's several things that we can uh, take home from this, but uh, notice the phrase that when the Apostle Paul was ministering, he was not adulterating the word of God. He was not mixing it with Eastern philosophy. He was not mixing it with human good. He was giving the straight distilled word of God. But in the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, when he spoke, he says, as God is my witness, and may he strike me down if I am not telling you the truth. That's how serious he thought the message of the gospel was. So then he says, and even if our gospel is veiled, and here we, start, we enter into this word veiled, and I've highlighted it uh, in the uh, portion on your screen, and we'll get to that in just a moment. If it is veiled, it is to those who are perishing. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So those who are perishing are the unbelievers, so that they might not see the light. And notice the contrast between blinded and light, veiled and light. The gospel of the glory of Christ, and the word glory exudes light. The glory of Christ, who is the image of God. In other words, you want to have this personal relationship with God. It is done through Jesus Christ. So, the Greek word for veil is different than the word in verse 2, which is the word hidden. And so verse 2 says, but we have renounced the hidden uh, things hidden because of shame. The word hidden is the Greek word kruptos, or kruptos with the accent on the uh, omicron, which means that which is concealed and private. And the word veiled means that which is obscured or difficult, if not impossible to see for its true identity. And the Greek word that is used there is the word kalukto, two different words. One means that the individual does not trot out and parade his dirty laundry in front of people. When you give the gospel, it doesn't mean that you tell the audience every single sin that you committed how you did it and the detail and how you did it. But simply that God has taken away your sin, separated as far as the east is from the west because of what Christ did on the cross. And that is what the word hidden. And so verse 2 says, but we have renounced those private things because they are shameful. And we don't walk around in craftiness. In other words, we're not pretending to be something that we're not, so as to adulterate the word of God. The word
word veiled in our verse, verse 3, means that which is obscured. And that which is obscured means that Satan has thrown a veil or has thrown something which makes the gospel hard to understand. First of all, the gospel is not understood by the natural man, the unbeliever. It has to be revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. But because we are involved in an angelic conflict, Satan likes to throw his veil over people's minds so that they can't understand. And sometimes you, as the communicator, help Satan because you introduce things which are not pertinent. You say things which are actually contradictory to the concept of grace. And so verse 3 tells us, that it is veiled, that it is only obscured, it is a fuzzy to those who are unbelievers. So these people who have decided not to believe in Christ, when they hear the gospel, they don't see it clearly anymore. They see it distorted, they see it fuzzy, they just see it out of focus. In other words, Paul is saying, that the gospel is preached by him, that, that the gospel that he preaches has not been adulterated so that you can't defy it, identify it as unique. One of the things that you will find about Christianity is that it is uniquely by grace. No, sir, no, ma'am. You do not do anything to help God to gain your salvation, your eternal life. He does it all. You never help God out because your help is so puny and stinky that it is no help. It actually gets in the way. So somebody will say, well, I think that you need to cry tears of repentance in order to gain eternal life. I mean, look at how long eternal life is and you would only be uh, in tears of repentance for a short time. Well, let me ask you this. How many tears does it take to fully repent? Does it take one? Does it take ten? Does it take a hundred? Maybe it takes a hundred and you only cried eighty-nine. Or ninety-nine and you're one tear short. Your help to God is like worthless. He paid it all. The gospel is unique because it is identified by grace and grace alone. All other religions, no matter which one it is, when you analyze them, they always come back to works. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about idol worship or whether you're talking about legalism. It always comes back that you have to do something to get God off your back. This gospel is blurry or indiscernible to the unbeliever because he has rejected it due to the blindness that Satan has cast on him. And that blindness is like a veil. He cannot completely obscure it because the Holy Spirit brings that message to that person. So how do you tell a counterfeit? You have to examine it. If it is Christ for something else, it's false. If you have to believe in Christ and hedge your bet, it's, some, it's not the true gospel. You must put all your eggs in one basket. You must put all your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. So let me address those of you who are listening to me now and you have never trusted in Christ as your personal Savior. You may have gone to Sunday school. You may have even gone to a vacation Bible school. Somebody may even have approached you and, and talked to you about the, the gospel. And you've considered, but you have never said, you know what, I am going to trust in Jesus Christ. He is going to take me to heaven. 
I urge you to do it today. And you can do it right there where you sit right now while you're looking at this computer screen. You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell your neighbor or anybody else. If you do contact me and tell me, that would be great. But it's great because I can then help you out to grow. Because it's one thing to be born. It's something else to grow into infant, from infancy into spiritual adulthood. So if you decide to write to me and to let me know, then we can move ahead from that point. Okay, we're talking about counterfeits. What do you think? Now, would you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want you to focus on verse 4 and verse 7. We will look at the context in just a moment. <clears throat> And let me read verse 4. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom you have not, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. And then verse 7. Or did I sin in humbling myself? so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. Well, let's begin. Let's begin this passage, and we begin with taking note of the fact that in our the first part of our verse, uh, or first part of verse 4, our verse, we have the phrase, another Jesus. And there's a Greek word that is used here. It is the Greek word, alos. And this is a word which means another of the same kind. And what this means is that the identity of Christ is lost because another is presented. So when you get somebody like the Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door, or the Mormons who come to your door, and they talk to you about, another Jesus. Look out. Look out. Because this Bible tells you that they are out of the ballpark. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, you bear that person beautifully. In other words, the person. In this case, we have a case where the Apostle Paul is uh, trying to uh, stoke up a little bit of humorous interest. So let me begin to read at verse 1 so that we can get this particular feel uh, or seasoning to this passage. The Apostle Paul writes, and he says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. For indeed, you are bearing with me. I want to call it irony, but it's not truly irony. There is a tongue-in-cheek issue here. And the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he says, I want you to bear with me in a little foolishness. In other words, I know that what I want to say to you sounds foolish to you, but just listen to me. Hear me out. Then we have a semicolon. But indeed, you are bearing with me. In other words, all that you're really doing is tolerating me. You don't realize that I am the servant of Jesus Christ. You don't, you don't realize that I am his divine apostle, and you are merely tolerating me. Somebody else comes, and you endure that person beautifully. See? Verse 2. For I am jealousy for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. And in verse 2 he's saying, you know, when I brought Christ to you in the gospel, it was like I was presenting you as 
the father in a wedding, and you are a true virgin, and I'm presenting you. And so I'm jealous for you. God help the man who would have raped you. God help the man who would have dishonored you. I'm presenting you with a godly jealousy. Verse 3, but I am afraid. But I am afraid, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. What is that purity and sincerity? What that is, is the simplicity of the gospel. Faith alone and Christ alone. Not faith in Christ and somebody else. It's not faith and works in Christ. It is faith alone in Christ alone. And so he says, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. There's this cloud within me. Verse 4. For if one comes, and now this is our verse, if somebody comes, let's call him a preacher, if some preacher comes and he presents to you another Jesus, see, another Jesus, a loss, one who denies the identity of the true Jesus but presents to you a different Jesus, hey, maybe he's a black Jesus. Maybe he's a Hispanic Jesus. Or maybe he's an Oriental Jesus. You know, Oriental from Asia. And he denies that identity as his being as the true Son of God. You welcome that person. You say, oh my goodness. Here we have this wisdom that comes from somewhere. And it's not the Bible. Number two, there's a word heteros in this uh, verse, and that is the word different. And heteros means another of a different kind. And this denies the similarity of nature. So if somebody presents to you somebody with a different identity, or somebody who presents you somebody else, who's not like the Jesus that we've talked about? Wow, you accept that person. What would that other Jesus be like? Well, he's the Jesus that uh, believes in globalism, universalism, that believes in ecumenicalism, that uh, says you don't have to believe in me uh, all you have to do is do good works. He is the one who says a homosexual union is okay. It's blessed by God. It is not. That's a different one and a different gospel. Number three. The picture that is presented in this passage is that if the gospel is adulterated, it's made into a different gospel. Even if it's only adulterated just a little bit, it is no longer the gospel. We need to understand that. Number four, the true gospel, by definition, is without charge or fee. Take a look at verse 7. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? In other words, when I gave you the gospel, I had to work my hands to the bone. I worked day and night. I had to work two shifts every single day just so that you could have the gospel and that I wouldn't have to charge you money. Did I sin? Verse 7 so that you could have eternal life because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? See, here is a litmus test. If the gospelizer, the gospeler person is saying, 
we need to take an offering so that this ministry can continue. <laughs> look, look at it. And look at this verse. Did I sin? The Apostle Paul is what? Talking with tongue and cheek. Okay, we're coming to the end of this class, but take a look at this comic picture that I have on the screen. You have a trapeze artist in a circus. He is flying from one trapeze swing to the next, and he's expecting to find his partner there who's going to catch him. His female assistant, no doubt. But she taped a message to that swing, and it says, Dear John, there's no easy way to tell you this. And you look down at the bottom in one of the three rings of the circus, and you can see that the elephant is sweating bullets. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been betrayed? Has somebody ever promised you something and you turn your back on that individual? Have you ever been a traitor? Have you ever given your word and let somebody down? Well, let's say that maybe you have, but let's just put that to the side. Let me ask you the question, has somebody ever betrayed you? Has somebody ever let you down? Has somebody ever promised their loyalty and then you didn't get any? This is where we're going with our next point. Would you turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, please? Galatians chapter 1. Basically, we're looking at the next book, Galatians chapter 1, the next book in the New Testament. And let's see how much time we have here. Well, I only have time to uh, introduce this passage. And so let me introduce it by reading uh, verses 6, 7, uh, 8, 9, and uh, I think I'll go a couple more, up to 10. The Apostle Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. The Apostle Paul is saying, you know, you are deserting the true gospel. And you're deserting him who provided this true gospel for you. That's God. Verse 7, which is not really another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. For even if we, or an angel from heaven. Now, remember, this is the angelic conflict class, and let me press this point. Even an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you. He is to be accursed. Anathema. Verse 9. As we have said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Please take note of the fact that the accursing takes place twice in one sentence right after the next. Do you think that it might be important? And then verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. 
And with this, we're going to have to stop this evening's session. I urge you once again to please uh, write your questions, your comments about this passage uh, or about anything else so that we can deal with it in due time. So I wish you a good evening and uh, we are dismissed.